Jeśli stracimy Ukrainę, stracimy pokój na dziesięciolecia. Porażka na Ukrainie może być początkiem końca złotego wieku zachodu. This is my first video update from Nicosia, Cyprus on this Tuesday morning. Let's talk about some news. And we have the Prime Minister of Poland, Mr. Morawiecki, speaking to the Atlantic Council. And he said that the defeat in Ukraine could be, could be the beginning of the end of the golden age of the West. So Morawiecki is speaking to neocons. So he's kind of speaking to, to the choir. He's preaching to the choir. And he is saying that any defeat in Ukraine, well, that spells trouble for us neocons and he's right he is absolutely right i would have phrased his statement more along the lines of a defeat in this proxy war with russia could be the beginning of the end of the collective west elite golden age i think that's a better way to phrase his statement but he's kind of spot on absolutely and You know, this is a, a problem of their own making. The neocons, they created this problem. They made the proxy war with Russia existential. They turned Ukraine into an existential issue. It didn't have to come to this. The, the collective West, the Biden, um, the Obama, Biden, White House and the European Union, They managed to, uh, to get a successful coup back in 2014 in Ukraine. They removed the democratically elected government of Yanukovych. They tried to, to nab Crimea. It didn't work. They failed there. They then tried a civil war with, uh, with the east of Ukraine. They attacked the east of Ukraine. They lost that civil war. They negotiated the Minsk agreements. They could have called it quits there. They could have said, okay, we tried. We got Ukraine, we got the puppet government, we lost uh, Crimea, we lost the, the East, done. We stop here, let's just follow the Minsk agreements and let's move on to the next, the next uh, regime change operation. But nope, they couldn't let it go. They couldn't let it go, so they didn't follow the Minsk agreements. They did the exact reverse, the opposite of what the Minsk agreements Uh, dictated. They decided to rearm Ukraine. They decided to, to build up the military. They decided to prepare Ukraine for another conflict with, uh, with the Donbass. And uh, they started to talk about Ukraine entering NATO and Ukraine getting nuclear weapons. And Russia said, you know, that's our red line. That is a security threat to Russia. Ukraine joining NATO joining this military alliance is a direct security threat to us. Ukraine obtaining nuclear weapons, that's a security threat to us. And so Russia said, you know, in order to, to calm things down, can, uh, can you tell the Alensky government to just make it so that Ukraine remains neutral? Let's put something in the constitution of Ukraine, some sort of law, something which says Ukraine will never join NATO. It will remain a neutral country. It won't join a military alliance like Switzerland or, I don't know, uh, Austria. Just giving a couple of examples. Maybe they're not correct examples to give, but I'm just saying many countries are neutral. Many countries say that they're neutral. There's no problem to say that you're neutral. No problem at all. It's actually a benefit, in, in, in my opinion, when dealing with, uh, with foreign policy. But anyway, they could, have, they could have just said, okay, so that we don't enter in some, into some sort of conflict, in some sort of existential conflict that could end up harming us, the United States or the European Union. Let's, let's do that. Let's just make it so that Ukraine is neutral and we'll leave it there. But nope, nope, unacceptable unacceptable. And so we are where we are. And we have Morawiecki saying that Ukraine, the proxy war against Russia, has now become existential for the 
golden age of the collective West elite. Ukraine was never an issue for everyday, everyday citizens of the collective West, everyday citizens of the US, everyday citizens of Europe or the EU. Ukraine was a non-issue. No one talked about it. No one cared about it over the last eight years. It wasn't, it wasn't a big deal. They turned it into this existential issue. And now you have Russia and China and BRICS and India, and they're now working together to get out of the collective West system because weaponizing the USD out of control sanctions policies is freaked everybody out, seizing assets, uh, kicking a country out of SWIFT. It's freaked out the entire rest of the world and they want out of this collective West system and it's now become existential. So that's the prime minister of Poland. By the way, there was the, the news yesterday that Ukraine and Poland plan to improve their, uh, their history, create a curriculum, an educational curriculum, according to the Minister of Education for Ukraine, create a curriculum that, that works to, to rewrite, to improve the history of uh, Poland and Ukraine. That's, that's pretty Orwellian. <laughs> that's pretty Orwellian. I wonder what they're going to, to come up with. What are they going to come up with? this new Polish Ukraine history that they're going to, that they're going to put together. Are they going to turn Bandera into some sort of uh, a good guy and they're going to blame everything on Russia? Probably. That's probably what they're going to, to put together. No doubt the, the Ukraine history, some of the, the textbooks for, uh, for the Ukraine, educational system are pretty, pretty out there. Stuff like the Ukrainians like built, built the Acropolis or stuff like that, built the pyramids. I mean, they've come up with some pretty wacky stuff. So I'm kind of interested to see what this new curriculum, this new history curriculum between Poland and Ukraine is going to give us. <laughs> and I'm looking at the tweet that, uh, that is talking about this news and it has that iconic photo of Duda hugging Alensky. I'll put it on the screen right now. That, that photo of Duda hugging Alensky, I mean, that is, I think that's like one of the best photos of, of this entire, like this entire story that, that we've seen play out over the last year and a half. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Alensky's like hugging Duda like he's, like dear life and dude is like just swallowing up Belensky and he's got this expression on his face like <laughs> oh man man oh man anyway let's uh let's talk about some other big news and this is kind of breaking news in a way and that is that Russian president Putin he visited the front line of the special military operation this was a surprise visit he made via helicopter. He went to the Kherson region and then he went to the Lugansk People's Republic. He met with military officials and commanders. He got a briefing as to how things are going, what the situation is. And that's, that's big. I think this is the first time that, that Putin has made this type of visit to, to the front lines. So... To me, this is uh, indicative of something, something it's, is on its way. Something is on its way. This could be Putin uh, going to the front line before the, the big spring offensive happens. Maybe this is Putin going to the front line in order to talk about something that the Russian military is going to be putting together. I don't know, but this is... Uh, this symbolizes to me, this symbolizes something is, is on its way. So that was big breaking news. The, uh, the BRICS are definitely, are definitely working 
working overtime to create this multipolar world order. They are, they are on the move. The BRICS are on the move. Yesterday, we had the Chinese foreign minister state that China is ready to work with Russia for the sake of global security and stability. He said, we are ready to strengthen mutual ties and, man and maintain close ties between our military. And as he made this statement, we had an American destroyer passing through the Taiwan Strait. So as the Chinese foreign minister was talking about deeper ties between Russia and China, especially on a military level, the U.S. military was flexing its muscle in the Taiwan Strait. We have a big deal. It's rumored that a big trade deal is going to be announced between Russia and India. That could come, that could come out any day now. Let's see what, what's going to happen there. We have Lavrov in Brazil. The foreign minister is in Brazil. He is going to be going to, let's see, Nicaragua, I believe, Venezuela and Cuba. And when he was in Brazil, he thanked the government of Brazil. And he thanked President Lula for, uh, for what he said about the conflict in Ukraine when Lula was in China. I'm back at the Tree of Life. And I don't know if you can see it, but there is a huge lizard right there. Let's see if I can get closer. Just a little bit closer. Oh, I didn't want to scare him. We have a lot of lizards in Cyprus. Somewhere back here. Oh, there we go. You see? <laughs> hey, buddy. Hey, buddy. <laughs> yeah. The tree of life. <laughs> Everybody. The tree of life of Cyprus. Where the lizards reside. All right. So, uh, yeah. So, Lavrov was like, you know, thank you, Lula, for what you said about the conflict in Ukraine when you were in China. And Lavrov, he also explained what, uh, what is happening in Ukraine, why uh, Russia is, uh, is fighting this proxy war against the collective West. He said, we are interested in bringing the Ukrainian conflict to an end as quickly as possible. On more than one occasion, we have explained in great detail the reasons for what is happening and the objectives we are pursuing in this regard, they are primarily there to ensure that there are no threats to the military security of the Russian Federation on the territory of Ukraine. The West has been implementing such plans for many years. The second objective, of course, is to protect the lives and legitimate rights of the Russian-speaking population of eastern and southern Ukraine. So that is what Lavrov said when he was in Brazil, once again explaining the objectives and the purpose of the special military operation, according to, to the Russian government. And since we're on the topic of Brazil, the Biden White House was not happy with uh, Lula's statements uh, in relation to the conflict in Ukraine and Kirby. Oh, and Kirby, he said, and I always forget Kirby's title, Director, Secretary, Director of National Security for the State Department, or whatever his title is. Anyway, Kirby said that Lula, Brazil, is parroting Russian and Chinese propaganda without understanding the facts, without taking a look at the facts. That is what Kirby said. So... In other words, Lula is a Putin troll. Brazil is a country of Putin trolls parroting Kremlin propaganda. And uh, they just haven't, you know, Lula, his administration, the people of Brazil, they just, they just haven't uh, looked into the facts, you know. They're just not as, enli as enlightened 
as Biden, as the Biden White House. They just don't understand the facts. And so it's up to Kirby and the U.S. State Department to explain to them the facts because it's just too too complicated for someone like Lula and his, and his administration to understand. <laughs> it's incredible, incredible statements from the Biden White House. They are, they are, they are diplomacy, I was going to say lightweights. They're not even lightweights. They're like diplomacy toddlers. Oh boy. Anyway, since we're on the subject of diplomacy and the U.S. State Department, Anthony Blinken, he issued a statement about what is happening in Sudan. And it looks like this, this regime change effort that the U.S. may have cobbled together in, uh, in Sudan is not working out too well. And he issued a statement. <laughs> he issued a statement and he said, I spoke to both Sudanese armed forces, Commander Wuhan, and the Rapid Support Forces Commander Dagalo and underscored the urgent need for ceasefire. Too many civilian lives have already been lost. Stressed the importance of ensuring the safety of diplomatic personnel and workers. So that is what Anthony Blinken tweeted the other day with regards to what is happening in Sudan. It looks like the regime change didn't work out. The last reports I have gotten is that the uh, Sudanese army is, is getting a handle on things. We'll see how all of this shapes out. But um, that's Blinken saying, you know, it didn't quite work out, so let's get some, some peace going. Let's get a ceasefire. That's the situation in in Sudan. Blinken was in Vietnam as well. This should be my clown world. He was in Vietnam a couple of days ago and he's on his way. He is right now in Japan for the G7 meeting. Did you guys know that there's a G7 foreign ministers meeting? I had no clue. <laughs> I mean, I had no idea that there was a G7 foreign, foreign ministers meeting in Japan. It just goes to show that the G7 has, has pretty much lost much of its clout. No one is really talking about it. <laughs> it's kind of like whatever. Anyway, on his way to Japan for the G7 meeting where he was going to meet with Annalena Baerbock and the UK's Cleverly and all of these people. Check out the, the selfie that the UK uh, foreign minister put, put up uh, of them in Japan. They're on like a high-speed train in Japan. <laughs> oh, my eyes, my eyes. I can't see selfies like this. My God, <laughs> that is just cringe, man. That is one cringe selfie. Anyway, on his way to, uh, to Japan, he stopped in Vietnam. And the goal of the trip to Vietnam was to convince the, the government of Vietnam to move away from China. That's the goal of this trip. But the interesting part about his meeting with the Vietnamese officials is that when Blinken was meeting with them, they had the Vietnamese flag, according to protocol, if you're going to be meeting with, with these high-level government officials, you're going to have the U.S. flag and the Vietnamese flag, right? That's the correct protocol. But as Blinken was meeting with Vietnamese officials, they only had the flag of Vietnam there. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't put the flag of the USA there, which is, which is saying a lot, in my opinion. It is really saying a lot. Uh, Jungle Joseph Burrell, he couldn't go to the, to the G7 in Japan because he's, he's ill with the, with the you-know-what. He's got that, that bug. And so he, uh, he participated via, via video. And he said this during the, the meetings with other foreign ministers, and he tweeted it out. He said, the consequence of the war affects us all. Russia is once again blocking 50 ships with urgently needed grain in the Black Sea. The EU supports 
UN efforts and will continue facilitating exports through the EU solidarity, solidarity lanes, which have brought 25 billion tons of grain to the world. Now, I thought that this grain was going to go to, to countries that were impoverished, that needed the food, but we learned from the row that is taking place between some EU member states, Poland, Slovakia, Hungary, Bulgaria, that the Ukraine grain is actually heading towards the EU and towards Europe. So the grain is not heading towards countries that, that need it. And, and furthermore, as Slovakia has now stated, they are on record. I believe Polish officials, Hungarian officials have also uh, stated they are on record saying that the grain was was crap. <laughs> I mean, I don't have another word to to describe it. It's full of chemicals and pesticides, and it's definitely not fit for for human consumption. It's not even fit for for animal consumption, and that's one of the reasons that the grain has been blocked. If not the main reason, it's also cheap. It's also cheap. Some people are saying that's not the main reason. The fact that it's cheap is not why it's blocked. No, the fact that it's cheap, that it's cheap is one of the reasons that it's being blocked and you have the health issues. The, the fact that this grain is full of chemicals. Anyway, what's my point here? My point is that the grain is not going to countries who need it. It's going to the European Union. The grain is being sold to the European Union so that it can fund Alensky's war efforts. It can go into the pocket of the Alensky regime. Let's just be honest about it so it can go into his pocket. And, and if anything, Russia is doing the world a favor because they're, they're blocking grain that is harmful to humans and animals. If indeed they are blocking the grain, I don't believe they're blocking the grain. Who knows? Who knows what's happening there, but even if they are blocking the grain, well, from what I understand, this grain is, is, not, so, is not so good. So better, better for it to stay blocked. Weapons. How about weapons to Ukraine since we're talking about selling grain and, and using the money from the grain to fund the war efforts? How about the weapons that go to Ukraine? The leopard tanks that are going to Ukraine so that they can mount this big spring offensive. Well, we have our first leopard tank destroyed. That's right. The first leopard tank has been destroyed. But the interesting part about it is that it was not destroyed in Ukraine on the battlefield. The leopard tank fell apart during training. I think it was training in Poland, if I'm not mistaken, either in Poland or in Germany. But as the Ukraine military was training on the Leopard 2A4 tank, the tank kind of fell apart. It broke. The turret came off. That is what happened. Now, there were people on Twitter saying that the photos, which you just saw on the screen, the photos of this leopard tank are fake and it didn't happen. The leopard tanks are the best. They are the wonder weapon. The leopard tanks are going to de deliver the defeat to, uh, to the Russian military and to the Putin regime. And uh, I said, okay, if that's the case and these photos are fake, well, let's do a little digging, just a little bit, like five, five, ten minutes of digging. And I found an article from the Daily Mail from 2018, which has the title, The Four Million Pound German Tank, dubbed one of the best in the world, is shown up in Syria. Leopard 2s bought by Turkey to fight British-backed Kurds has numerous faults exposed in lethal fashion. The German government has come under domestic pressure after images showed Turkey deploying the tanks. From the late 1970s to today, more than 3,000 of the tanks have been built at a cost of around 4 million pounds a unit. Turkey bought 354 of them and has started using them to fight Kurdish fighters in cities in northern Syria. But they are providing to be they are proving to be ineffective. They are proving to be ineffective with the tanks being picked off by allied forces as they are sent in alone. As they are sent in alone. 
no air cover, which is how the leopard tanks are going to go into the the offensive with no air support, and they are getting picked off in Syria. And this is from 2018, and this is the Daily Mail. So obviously the Leopard tanks, while well, I'm positive they're good tanks, they're very good tanks, and they're very effective tanks, a Leopard tank alone is not going to be the wonder weapon that everyone is saying it's going to be. Since we're on the subject of the spring offensive, we have the intel chief, Mr. Budanov is, uh, is his name. He gave an interview, Kirill Budanov, he gave an interview, I believe, to Ukraine media yesterday. And he talked about the spring offensive. And he said that uh, the spring offensive is going to be amazing and fast. Amazing and fast. By the way, Newsweek is saying that the spring offensive will begin on April 30th, according to leaked documents, the leaked documents that they've that they've examined. So we actually have a date now for the spring offensive. Mark it on your calendars. It's April 30th. But uh, Budanov, the intel, military intel chief of the Olensky regime, this guy's a big time uh, a Russia hater. He's got like a map in his in his office of Russia broken up into five or six different pieces. So he's He's that type of, of thinking. And uh, he, he said that the spring offensive is going to be amazing, amazing and fast. I mean, it's going to be like D-Day on, on steroids. You know, it's, it's just going to be devastating. That's what the spring offensive is going to be. It's, it's going to be like, instead of saving Private Ryan, it's going to be saving Private Alensky. I mean, Spielberg is going to make movies about the spring offensive. That's how amazing it's going to be. Budanov also said that the counteroffensive of the armed forces in Ukraine is going according to plan, but he will not voice the plans for its implementation. And he confirmed his forecast that by the end of spring, the armed forces of Ukraine will enter the Crimea by the end of spring. In a month, two months latest, Ukraine will be in Crimea. As they have said many times, they will be fishing in Crimea. That is what they said, swimming and fishing in Crimea. He also said that uh, Russia, Russia has now moved towards a defensive posture, defensive position to hold on to territory. He said that Ukraine will not retreat from Bakhmut. That's what Budanov is saying. This guy's a pretty big BSer as well, but you know, that is, uh, that is his claim. By the way, we're getting reports now of, um, we're getting reports that Russia, the Russian military is now using Fab 500 bombs, like big bombs in, in, I believe, uh, Kupiansk direction and Bakhmut. These are the reports that we're getting. We're getting video images. If this is indeed true, well, then that's, uh, that's bad news for Budanov, Elensky, and the Ukraine spring offensive. Let's, uh, let's wrap it up with one more story and we'll do a clown world. Let's talk about Dutch intelligence. How about Dutch intelligence, which is saying that Russia and China are the biggest threat to national security. China is pursuing Dutch high-tech companies through corporate acquisitions, academic cooperation, as well as digital espionage, insider information, secret investments, and illegal exports, according to to the General Intelligence and Security Service. They published this report on Monday. They also said that Russia is also taking actions that include espionage, espionage activities. This is according to Dutch Intel in this paper that they published. So the enemy, the number one enemy, the biggest threat 
for the Netherlands is China and Russia. I tend to believe that the biggest threat to the Netherlands is from within. I would say it's, it's, uh, it's the WEF, it's the globalists, it's the globalist elites, the Klaus Schwab puppets. I would say that that's the biggest threat, but who am I to say? Who am I to say? Let me know, people who are living, watching this video, living in the Netherlands, what is the biggest threat right now? Here is a tweet from Eva Vlardingerbroek. She said, the Dutch government announced it will be giving 100 million euros in aid to Ukrainian farmers, all whilst spending billions on the destruction of our Dutch farmers. We're being ruled by the worst of the worst globalist scum. Mark Rutte, you make me sick. I tend to side with Eva over Dutch intel. Eva, I think you're... You're pretty spot on there, but once again, um, I'm not living in the Netherlands, so who am I to say? No doubt, the Netherlands, in my opinion, the Netherlands is the test case. Let's just say the, the guinea pig, the test case for the, the brave new world food agenda. Let's call it that, the brave new world food agenda. I think the Netherlands is the test case for that. And Germany to me is like the test case for the brave new world energy agenda. I think those two countries are like the, the test tube, guinea pig uh, experiment. Food, the Netherlands, energy, Germany, and you know, the globalists, they're like, let's see how all of this turns out. All right, let's, um, let's do a clown world. Let's do a clown world. And in this clown world, we'll talk about Twitter. <laughs> we will talk about Twitter. I don't know if you're seeing all the lizards in this tree, but anyway, I hope I hope you guys can catch them. They're they're very well camouflaged in the tree. That's why they're they're there for protection. Protection from from guys like me filming them on, on video. <laughs> they don't want to be on video, the lizards, the Cypress lizards. Anyway, Twitter, 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 Twitter. We have got the CBC, the state broadcaster of Canada, has now been labeled state, state media on Twitter. And boy, were they upset. Justin Trudeau was really upset. I mean, he was hurt that uh, the CBC has now received the label of state media. They're so upset that they are going to stop tweeting. <laughs> That's how upset they are. The Canadian Broadcasting Corporation has halted its use of Twitter after being labeled government-funded media. The public broadcaster says this label undermines its credibility. Now, I don't, I don't think this label undermines your credibility. I think your reporting undermines your credibility. <laughs> but, you know, hey, I, I said this in a video I did three, four days ago that the reason that they're so upset is because they received the label that was at one point in time exclusive to, to RT or to Russian news or Iranian news or China, Chinese news, they were the ones that would get slapped with the state media label and Collective West uh, state media entities would never get the state media label. So they were, always to, they, they were always able to say, ah, you see RT, state media, right? It was kind of an elitist thing. They know, they know they're state media. They know they're state media, but now they've been given the same label that the Russians or the Iranians or the Chinese were given and they can't stand it. They've lost their elite position. They've lost their elitism and that's why they're so upset. But they are state media, no doubt about it. Justin Trudeau was very upset. He gave a speech talking about how upset he was, crying about how upset he was. And uh, Elon Musk, he put out a tweet and he said, Canadian Broadcasting Corp said they're less than 70% government funded so we corrected the label <laughs> and underneath the CV, CBC, Elon Musk put the label 69% government funded media. <laughs> 
69% government funded media. <laughs> well played, Elon Musk. Well played. So Justin Trudeau, he called Elon Musk and he said, uh, he said, Elon, Elon, this is Justin Trudeau, Prime Minister of Canada. Uh, hello, Justin Trudeau. Hello, Mr. Prime Minister. What, uh, what can I do for you? Well, Elon, before I, I tell you what the problem is, I just want to congratulate you on your, uh, your Teflon cars. I really love driving the, the Teflon cars. They're, they're really just amazing. The fact that they're, they're all electricity and, and they don't use any oil or gas or, or fossil fuels. I, I just think it's amazing, uh, uh, Elon. So thank you very much for, for your Teflon cars. Uh, Justin, you idiot. Uh, the, the car is a Tesla. The company is Tesla, not, not Teflon. Oh, oh, oh okay. I, I, th that makes more sense now. I wasn't sure why you, why you would call it Teflon, but Tesla makes more sense. A anyway, Elon, I'm really upset that, that you have labeled the CBC as, as state media. I just want you to know, Elon, that my government, we've invested 500 million of Canadian taxpayer money into the CBC. And now you label them state media. It's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to hurt my investment. Uh, Justin, you just made the case for me. The fact that you gave them 500 million means that they're state media. Do you understand? Um, no, no, I don't understand. Elon, what, what, what's your point? Trudeau, you idiot. I don't have time to waste to waste on you. I need to, to build a spaceship. <laughs> Click. Goodbye. That's the video, everybody. The Duran.locals.com. We are on Rumble, Rockfin, Odyssey, BitChute, and Telegram. Go to the Duran shop. 10% off. Use the code. Good day. Take care.